Good morning, Station Hill Church family. Pastor Jay Strother here with you, and this is week two of my sabbatical this summer. I'm grateful to our church for providing this time away so we can renew and refresh and be ready to go for another season of ministry. This week, my wife Tiny and I are spending some time away celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary. It doesn't happen until later this fall, but this summer was the right time for us to get away. So pray for us and know that we're praying for you and we miss you as you gather. But we're excited that today we get to continue our series, Letters to the Church at Station Hill. And there to wrap up Revelation chapter two with you is Coach Dale Clayton. Now, I wanted Coach Clayton to come preach at Station Hill for several reasons. One, he's one of the trustees who helps guide and direct our church. Number two, uh, he is an effective man of God who helps guide and lead our racial unity team. Number three, he is a legendary college basketball coach coaching at places like Vanderbilt University and being the head coach for years at Carson Newman University as well. He now has an effective ministry to other college basketball coaches through a ministry called Nations of Coaches. So pray for him as he prays for and walks alongside of and disciples many college basketball coaches throughout the nation. But today, the real reason that I wanted him to be at Station Hill is because he has a passion and a love for God's work. And you're going to get to hear the overflow of that today. So, will you join me in giving a big Station Hill welcome to Coach Clayton as he comes to preach. Good morning. This is like two a days. <laughs> Those of you that know anything about, uh, I hope that's okay. <clears throat> Um, sometimes in, in coaching, we practice in the morning, then we come back and practice in the afternoon, and then sometimes we come again and practice in the evening. Uh, so I feel like I'm having two a days. But I'm excited to be here. I, I thank your pastor, uh, Jay, for allowing me the privilege of coming. Uh, it's not easy for a pastor to give his pulpit up to someone else because he has responsibility of caring for his sheep. And so when you do that, you want to be sure that the people that you give access to your sheep are people that will be faithful uh, to lead and guide them the way that they should go. Uh, my challenge today is to try and help you get an idea of what's happening in the church at Thyra Tower. Uh, I want to do that and I want to try to keep it simple. I want to start out by telling you how I would do this. Uh, I did coach for 39 years. Um, and one thing you learn from coaching is you always coach with the end in mind. Now, I, I like saying that because that's what, what Isaiah says, that, that I'm God, there's no one like me. I've declared the end from the beginning. And so I always say that God has us live with the end in mind. Not what we're doing today, as good as that is, but there is an end. And what we do today needs to reflect where we want to be in the end. And so you, you live life with the end in mind. Um, as a coach, one of the things we always do is we start with fundamentals. And we do that so that our players can be the best that they can be, especially when the games get tough. Uh, when the game's on the line, you have to execute, you have to rely on your fundamentals. Poor fundamentals will lead to a lot of losses. And so it is in our faith, in our Christian walk. There's a fundamental that we have to rely on. And that fundamental is that God's word is true. The truth is the fundamental. Whatever's happening in life, whatever we're going through, whenever there's any questions, you always go back to the truth. You always go back to, but God said, you see. So that's the fundamental, our truth. And, and you know, in basketball, you, I like to use shooting as an example. And some of you young guys here that still might be playing, you'll know how to help yourself. Some of you older guys, you'll know why you're never any good. Um, <laughs> because uh, with, with basketball, you play with your fingers, the tips of your fingers. You don't play with the palm of your hand. You don't catch the ball in the palm of your hand. You don't pass the ball from the palm of your hand, and you certainly don't shoot the ball from the palm of your hand. 
So you, you've got to learn that. You've got to practice it over and over and over again so that you can be good at it. I want to suggest to you that you have to practice the Word of God over and over and over again. Jesus said that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You can't leave, live by that if you don't know it. You don't know it if you can't study it, 2 Timothy 2.15. You steadily show yourself approved unto God, a workman who need not to be ashamed because you can rightly divide the, sword, the word of truth. Part of what happens, a major part of what happens in Revelation, the church at Thyatira, is for all the good things that the people did, they had one basic problem. That problem was they did not stay faithful to the word of truth. And so let, they let a so-called prophetess Jezebel, the spirit of Jezebel, it was not the actual Jezebel because she had died and gone the way, I used to say gone the way of the buffalo, she went the way of the dogs, <laughs> if you know the story, because that's, that's what happened to her. Thank you, I like that. Huh? <laughs> so, um, so their problem was they just really didn't know the truth, and they didn't understand the truth, and because they did not, they allowed themselves to be led astray. And so the first thing that we want to think about when we look at this picture is make sure we don't do that. <clears throat> um, it's interesting. Uh, when I think of truth, I like to think of John 18, chapter 18, I think somewhere around verse 37. Um, when Jesus is talking to Pilate, and Pilate says, well, they say you are a king. And he said, Jesus' response was, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. But then he made this interesting statement. He said, for this purpose I came into the world that I might bear witness to the truth. And so, because he didn't have any idea what Jesus was talking about, Pilate said, what is truth? Have you thought about that? What is truth? The scriptures tells us that the word of God is truth. The scriptures tell us, uh, sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth, O Lord, in John 17, 17. He, he comes along later talking about the truth. And he says that uh, everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God is true because that's who God is. God is himself true. God can only speak truth. He can't do anything else. And that's really important for us to understand. It's important for us to understand that when we have an issue about something, the only place that we can go to get to resolve that issue is to the Scripture. I can go to someone else, but what they say to me may not be based on Scripture. So I can't take what they say and then use that or apply that. Not in my life as a believer, I can't do that. Now the non-believer, they can. And I'm not talking about subjective truth. That's what we get into now, postmodernism, subjective truth. I've got my truth, you've got your truth, everybody's got their truth, so no one's in agreement. And then, not only that, but our opinion changes because the truth changes. When you stand on the word of God, which is truth, there is no change to take place. In a simple statement, the problem with the church at Thyatira is even though they did many good things, they fail to stay faithful to the truth. So they let someone come in and cause them to compromise. And that becomes very problematic. So what I want to do is try to help us understand that, but I want to do it in the spirit of, of Paul. I like what Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians when he said that, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. I came in weakness, I came in trembling, so that wisdom would not be the issue. Because your wisdom should not stand on man, but on the power of God. Okay. And that's what I want to try to do. I'm, I'm not going to talk to you about anything I know because I don't know anything. Okay, the only thing I have to share with you is the truth of the gospel. And once I walk outside the truth of the gospel, you should close your ears. Because that means I have nothing of value to offer you. 
You may not agree with the truth of God. That's not my problem. Okay? That's between you and God. My responsibility is to just speak truth. It's your responsibility to listen and hear and know truth. But I will remind you of this. If you have not familiarized yourself with the word of God, you won't know truth when you hear it. See? To me, the biggest struggle for the church, and it will be a struggle for you and for any church, and it's what causes, causes the problem for the church at Thower Tower. They did not know the truth when they heard it. They did not know that God's word was true. And I want to say this. The reason we don't know that God's word is true is because we're biblically illiterate. That's a hard statement to make, but it's true. We are biblically illiterate. If you want to do this, test people sometimes and test them on their favorite scripture. I've been amazed at how many times I've asked someone, tell me what is your favorite scripture? And then they can't even quote it. And I said, well, where is it? They said, well, it's, it's over there in John. I said, which one? The Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Which one? And what I'll say to them is, I'm talking to you as if I know nothing at all about the Scripture. So you've got to give me all the right information to help me out here. But try that sometimes. And not only that, they not only don't quote it correctly, they can't tell you where it is. Well, I'm not very bright, but what I start to say is, well, that can't be their favorite. For example, there's chocolate pie, there's key lime pie, and there's uh, pecan pie. And, but if you ask me which one is my favorite, I don't ever get that wrong. Okay? It's coconut cream pie. <laughs> and not only that, I know exactly where to go get it. I don't want it from just any place or just somebody that says they've got coconut cream pie on the menu. That's not what I do. I go to my favorite place where I went one time, bought one, I was going to bring it home. It was an hour and a half drive, and I ate the whole pie before I got home. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, a, that's a true story. My wife of almost 51 years is sitting there. She can verify that. Okay. But let's, let's see what's happening here with the church at Tower Tower. Remember I told you that Jesus said that he came to bear witness of the truth? Well, I wonder, what does that mean? I mean, I ask questions. And I ask questions not because I'm smart, but because there's a guy named Howard Hendricks who's one of the best Bible teachers in the world. And I read one of his books that was called Living by the Book. And what that book does is it teaches you how to study the Bible. Okay? And one of the things he said is that you have to ask questions. Who, what, when, where, how. So I get used to asking all those questions when I'm, when I'm studying. And so when I start reading this and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, boy, there are a lot of questions that need to be asked here. And I asked a question in John 18 about Jesus being the truth. And he came to bear witness of the truth. And I came away with the conclusion that what he meant was that he came so that people would know that God is. But there's a problem. I kept studying, and when I kept studying, I came across 1 Timothy, and 1 Timothy said it differently. It said that God desires that all men would know the truth, and then he tells you what the truth is, that there is one God, and there's one mediator between God and man, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. You see, the truth was not just that Jesus came. The truth was he came for a purpose. He came to be the mediator between God and men. He came to be God's man's only hope to restore a relationship with God that he broke, not that God broke. See? And I thought, well, when did the problem take place? Now, if I ask you that question, you're going to tell me the problem took place where? In Genesis. If I ask you where in Genesis did it take place, what will you tell me? Okay, now, let's assume that you're talking to me, and I know nothing about the Bible. And I can't know everything about the Bible. I can't know where every scripture is. But there are certain things that we like to talk to people about, especially if we're sharing the gospel. Okay, so for those things, i got to be able to deliver the mail. <laughs> you follow me? You, you, you're shaking your head. You get what I'm saying? So now i got to go to Genesis 3, verse 4. I think that's right. Alan, don't you check me out now. 
Just, just trust me, okay? And here's where the problem starts. We see the appearance of the first great lie. You remember that? And here was that lie. You shall surely not die. Remember that? He's talking to Eve, and Eve said, well, here's what God said. We eat of that fruit, we got problems. He said, no, you surely won't die. And what he did then, he's still doing today. See, as you study the word and you hear God's truth, then Satan says to you, that's not true. Do you really believe that? And so that becomes problematic for us. And so what we do then is we start to question what God has said, the author of truth, the one in whom there is no lie. The scripture says God is not like man that he should lie. Somewhere over in Romans chapter 3, he makes that statement. See, that's a big issue. Because if in, in, in uh, at the church at Thyatira, if they had remembered that, See, now when Jezebel comes in, or the spirit of Jezebel, they know to do that. No, I don't want to hear that. No, I got a problem. I can't pay attention to you. It's problematic. But instead, here's what it says. I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. Well, that sounds perfect. It's a great church. They're doing a lot of good things. Until he continues and says, but I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, who calls herself a prophetess, who calls herself a prophetess. Okay? What we know is this. Either she was not a prophetess, or if she was, she wasn't a prophet of God. And in fact, she was a prophetess, but she was a prophetess with Baal, a totally different story. And she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. That's a real problem. She commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Acts of immorality. Uh, Baal worshipers, part of that included sexual immorality. And that's what they're referring to here. That's problematic. Now, it's problematic for several reasons. One reason, 2 Thessalonians makes this statement, that this is the will of God for you, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Can't be any plainer than that. And yet, that's exactly where this church is finding themselves. Because what, it, what they have done is they have chosen to listen to false doctrine. They've chosen to listen to that which isn't true. They could not separate the truth from a lie. And they couldn't do it because they never knew what the truth was. See? Or if they knew the truth, they started listening to the lie over and over and over and over and over again. And what happens when you do that? You start to believe it. So that's a problem. The problem is they did not stay faithful to the truth. And what it did was it caused them to be an adulterous church. They committed adultery by serving other gods. Problematic. And as a result of that, they were not a holy church. And that's problematic. Hmm, I just thought of a verse that I'll throw out there at you that's found over in 1 John. Now, you all have already studied 1 John, right? Okay, so you all are familiar with this verse. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see, what does it say? Behold what man of children we are, that we should be called the sons of God. Yet it does not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears that we will be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone that has this hope in him, he purifies himself even as God is pure. Amen. How about that one? It's a, there's a holiness issue that's going on here. Because of their action that they're taking. There's a holiness problem. 
And God said, be ye holy, for I am holy. In Hebrews, he says, pursue peace with all men and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. You see the problem they're having? They became tolerant. They started listening to someone in the church who was not a follower of Christ. Now, in the church, that's important. If you remember over in the book of Acts, I don't know, maybe chapter 20, 21, dealing with Paul, even Ephesus and all that, and Paul makes this statement. He says, you, you remember when he was there and, and he told me, you'll never see my face again, and it said how they started crying at the fact that they would never see Paul's face again? And he gave him one last warning. He said, beware, for there will arise among you wolves in sheep clothing that will lead you astray. See? All that glitters, not gold. And all that come through those doors are not followers of Christ. That's just the truth. You know, it's sad, but it's true. See? Your responsibility is to know the truth because the truth will make you free. Your responsibility is to be sanctified in the truth. Okay? But again, you can't do that if you don't have a working relationship with the Scripture. The Scripture says in Peter, laying aside all malice, guile, envy, and jealousies, do this. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so be you have tasted and know that God is good. You see? The problem with the church at Thyatira Tower is they have come in, they've listened to false teaching, and as a result of listening to false teaching, they are now on their way down a very dangerous road. They are, they are committing adultery with God. That's problematic. So, how do you resolve that? You resolve it by knowing the truth. I like to ask a question, and the question is, why do you believe the Bible? If that's your guide for life, why do you believe the Bible? Or better yet, how do you know the Bible's true? Better yet, as a believer, can you explain and tell someone else why you believe the Bible? And I may have said this before, and do it without saying, because the Bible changed my life. Because that's what I always hear, that the Bible changed my life. That's my testimony, the Bible changed my life. And someone else could read the Koran and say, hey, the Koran changed my life. That's my testimony. Then what do you say? You've got to understand why you believe what you believe. Charles Spurgeon made a comment one time, and he said, it matters not whether that which is preached is true or not. A sermon is a sermon, just the shorter the better. Now, if you know anything about Charles Spurgeon, his sermons were like that. But what he was saying is, this is how the world has changed. No one's interested in hearing the truth anymore. No one wants to give their time to the truth anymore. They just come in and just kind of scratch it off the list. I, I, I tell you what, uh, Easter Sunday for me, the, ch the church service on Easter Sunday was a real difficult service for me because I got something in my mind and I couldn't get it out. And what I got in my mind was this. I sat in the auditorium over at Brentwood on Concord and it was absolutely packed. And they had people in overflow rooms. And I'm sitting there, and instead of being excited that everybody was there, you know what was going through my mind? And where are we every week? What are we doing? Are we playing games with God? Do we really believe God is who he says he is? Hmm? Do I really believe that? Do I, do I believe like Job, who said that the word of God has become to me as my necessary food. I can't live without it. 
When you get to that point and the false prophetess comes in, you can deal with her because you know the truth and you can tell the truth from a lie. And for all she says, it will not impact you. It doesn't impact them. Why should it impact you? What do I mean when I say it didn't impact them? Jesus, in talking to the Pharisees, said, you don't believe or hear what I say because you're of your father, the devil. And he's the father of lies, and he, he was a liar from the beginning. There's no truth in him. And when he speaks, he speaks the lie because that's his very nature. Our nature should be, the tr should be the opposite. Even though we're not perfect, the lie in our life, whether it's what we speak or what we say, should be the exception to the rule and not the rule. It should be the exception to the rule and not the rule. And so we have to know God's word so that God's word can drive us. See? So when someone says to you, man, I really, I, I, man, I'm excited about you. I'll tell you what, man, I, you are a righteous person. I, I just, I get excited when I'm around you. Now, what most of us would do to that person is say, Man, you're not righteous. What do you mean talking about? He's not a righteous guy. You can't be righteous. See? But there's a problem with that. The problem with that is 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where God made him who was not sin to be sin so that in Christ we would become what? The righteousness of God. That's God's desire for us. It's to be holy as he's holy. But this false prophetess has come to Thyra Tower, and she, they have tolerated her lies to the point where they started believing it, to the point where they have now started to be involved in sexual immorality. The spirit of Jezebel, not Jezebel herself, but the spirit of Jezebel. And, and, and you all, I'm sure somewhere along the line, Pastor Jay has given you all some idea of who Jezebel is. You know, and you know that she was not one of the best people going around. Oh, let me say it this way. She had her issues. You know, and we all have issues. But she had some serious issues. Okay? Really a problem. Really a problem. You know, I, 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 my wife always telling me, she said, now when you get up and you say something, don't try to tell a joke. Honey, can I tell a joke? Now, she said no. Okay. Now, the reason is, I'm one of those guys, I never get the punchline. Never. And I have to go back and she'll say, but you missed the punchline, honey. I'm just awful. So the only thing I know is to get up and just be truthful. And be serious about the word of God, because the word of God is serious. That doesn't mean you can't say something funny. It just means I can't. Because I'm not, I'm not very good at it. All I know is this. God gave me a basketball coach named Phil World, who, when I was not a Christian, didn't believe in Christianity because I didn't know anyone that lived like a Christian. Can you believe that? I didn't know anyone that lived like a Christian. Now, I knew people who said they were Christians. But I listened and I paid attention. I just didn't see anyone that lived life like a Christian. So I'm wondering, is this really true? <laughs> Can you really be that way until I met Phil World? And he did it every day, every day, every day, to the point where I, I came up with this great idea. I said, you know what? I need a life statement. I need something to live my life by. And so it's this, to live in such a way that I may live in testimony to the power of God's saving grace, that when God saves you, he changes you. He makes you different. And he gives you in the Holy Spirit the ability to tell a lie from the truth. And he gives you the ability to walk away from those lies and to try to keep yourself focused on the truth. So that you don't do what we find happening here in, in, in uh, Thyra Tower. And even with all the problems and their adultery, God still said, I love you. God said, you know what? 
let's do this. If you will just repent. That's all you got to do, repent. First Thessalonians gives the example of repenting as turning away from idols and serving the living God. Or turning to God away from idols. That's that repentance. And so God says to her, repent. She does it. He tells the people, repent. They don't. God has told us to repent. But why don't we repent? Because we don't believe the truth? Is that what it is? All the good things that you've done at Station Hill, all the growth that you have, if you do not pay attention to the truth, you will go the way of the church of Thyatira. Right. And make no mistake about it. God not only wants you to walk in truth, he wants you to walk out holiness because that's who he is. He wants you to be a holy bride. See? And he wants you to, to hold each other accountable. See? And again, here's why you have to know the truth is the issue. Because when things fall apart and you start to struggle, the only way to get back on the right track is to go back to the truth. The only way to stay on the right track is to stay with the truth. There's never a time when we can get away from truth and expect to be all that God has called us to be in Christ Jesus. I told you about coaching and the fundamental. We're trying to win a game. We're trying to win a championship. We got to understand the fundamentals so that we get that done. But according to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we do it for a crown that's an earthly crown. Maybe a little wreath on our head. But what he's talking about is a crown of righteousness that the righteous judge will give to you on that day. You got to do it his way. You got to live life his way. And you got to bear witness to the testimony to the, to the, and be a witness to the truth that God is who he says he is. All the time. So he says, repent. He says to the church there, repent. And then he talks to him about overcoming, about being an overcomer. Now, I like to do this. Forgive me for doing this, but I like to do this. Because you've studied 1 John, you know what an overcomer is, right? I see one or two heads shaking. I see the other heads going like, don't ask me. Huh? <laughs> First John chapter 5, an overcomer. What if I told you that those of you who've been saved by God's grace, that you're an overcomer? Because here's what it says. An overcomer is one who is born of God. And if we're born of God, then we've got to live a certain way. We've got to live for him. Why? Because the chief end of man is to glorify God. I want to mention something to you along this line of truth that I mentioned uh, to the last group. You know, we, we live at a time where everybody has their own truth and everyone has their own answer, but a lot of the answers aren't scriptural. And so I like to ask believers this question because of Roe versus Wade. And I like to ask them, why are you opposed to abortion? I love to ask that question because I already know what the answer is. Oh, oh, okay. Well, you know, I, I told him, honey, back there, that this thing was falling off. I hope that's better. Um, it's not his doing. It's my doing. Um, but I like to ask that question to believers. I don't ask non-believers because they don't know. Okay? Because what they tell me, well, that's not the issue. Anyway, but I like to ask believers because I like to see how grounded you are. And if you got this thing right. And you know what the answer I always get is? I, I get the same answer all the time. What do you think the answer is? What are, it's murder. You can't murder. See? So they'll say that, and I like for them to say that. 
Because I think that's one of the Ten Commandments. Okay? Thou shalt not kill. I think that's one of them somewhere in there. And I said, well, okay, you're against it because of that. I said, well, let me ask you this. It also says don't bear false witness. You pay much attention to that one? No, but it's murder. I said, that's not the issue. Murder has nothing, very little to do with it. Very, very little to do with it. But that's the answer we give because we don't understand what the real issue is. We don't understand what the real truth is. The truth is that God created us to glorify him and to enjoy him, to glorify him. So the real issue is found in the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians. Do you know that your body is not your own? What? It's my body. I do what I wrote. No, no, no. That's for the non-believer. But the believer, do you know that your body is not your own? That your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? That God lives in you? And so he says, do what? Therefore, glorify God in your body. That's the real issue. Is I do those things which bring glory to God. That's why I have to understand the word. So that I don't get caught in all these conversations that don't mean anything. See? And when you, when you use that as a basis when you're talking to a believer. Now, remember, I didn't say the other group, but to a believer. The answer's got to be different because the answer is based on the truth. And the truth is found in God's word. And in Colossians 3.17, he says, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all to the glory of God. Amen. This is a God issue. If you're a believer, it is. But how can you know the truth and the truth set you free if you don't really know the truth so it can set you free? That's the problem with the church at Tower Tower. Tower. They moved away from the truth and they bought a lie. And that lie caused them to commit adultery with God. That's the issue. See, that's the issue there. I want to finish with this. Um, the repenting part that we don't seem to, we want to do it, but we just don't have time. We don't, we don't get it right. You know, I'll do it tomorrow or the day after. But at some point, I'll, I'll get it done. Just trust me, I'll get it done. And so it reminds me of this fellow. Uh, and he said that, uh, he said he knelt to pray, but not for long. He just had too much to do. For bills had to be paid because they would soon be due. And so he said a hurried prayer. He jumped up off his knees. His Christian duty now was done so his mind could be at ease. All through the day, he had no time to speak a word of cheer. No time to speak of Christ to friends because they'd laugh at me, he feared. No time, no time. That was his constant cry. No time to give to those in need, but at last, it was time to die. And when before the Lord he came, he looked with out, out, downcast eyes, and within his hand, he held a book. It was the book of life. He looked into the book and said, your name I cannot find. Well, I once was going to write it down, but I just never found the time. Wow. Now, I don't know about you, but that gets my attention. That gets my attention. It's all about the book because it's all about the God who authored the book. It's all about him. And if the church at Tower of Thyra stayed true to the truth of the gospel, they would not have committed adultery with God. And if Station Hill is going to stay true to the gospel or any other church, and I'm not talking about the building, I'm talking about the people that make up the body of Christ, then the only way to do that is to stay truthful and true to the word of God. Father, we thank you for your love, your goodness, and your mercy. We thank you that you decided to have your word written down in such a way that we would have access to it. Lord, I pray that we will live by your word. We will trust your word. And even again, as Job, your word will come to us 
is our necessary food. Thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen.